I'm Slava Tilba. Welcome to Conversations with Slava. Today I'm talking to Professor Samuel Moen. You are the Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence and Professor of History at Yale University. You are the author of the books The Last Utopia, Human Rights and History, Human Rights and the Uses of History, Christian Human Rights, and Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World. Moreover, you have written for Jacobin, Boston Review, The Chronicle of Higher Education, The New Republic, The Nation, The New York Times, and Dissent. Professor Moen, first, I would like to talk about Judge Amy Coney Barrett. How would Miss Barrett becoming a Supreme Court Justice likely affect labor rights? You know, that's a great question. Um, it, it, it is, um, the, the, unlike many nominees to the court, she's done some academic writings um, uh, beyond the opinion she's written as a serving judge the last three years. Um, none of her academic writings, um, to the best of my knowledge at least, say anything about labor rights, but um, at least one of her opinions um, does indicate that she um, is, is not going to be a good friend of the trade unions and uh, uh, of labor rights uh, more generally. You know, it's hard to say because this topic I don't think is going to be very central to the debate around her, but it is an important one and um, it, 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 it will undoubtedly shift the um, jurisprudence of the Supreme Court she's likely to join to the right. Now, that said, um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, whom Barrett is re replacing, was herself not um, the most um, progressive jurist on the social question uh, as, as past judges have been. Um, a study found that she was n near the middle of the most a business-friendly court in the United States in a century. So I don't predict that there will be that much difference. And on abortion rights? Well, there I think the answer is much clearer. Um, of course, you know, she, she Amy Barrett is not going to say outright that she regards Roe v. Wade, the 1973 Supreme Court case uh, wrongly decided, but you know everyone's proceeding on the assumption that that she holds that view, and you know the 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 big the big question I think is if she joins the court is will Roe continue to die by a thousand cuts, small um, small invitations to states to um, to confine the abortion right and in, in an ever smaller practical space, or will five or even six of the judges on the court uh, just overturn Roe v. Wade now? That's the open question. Um, but I don't think there's any real doubt that, um, that, that Judge Barrett is, is, is an enemy of that precedent. And uh, the power of the executive branch in domestic affairs, holding police, ICE, Drug Enforcement Administration, API accountable. You know, that's an excellent question. I wish I knew more about it. I mean, I've not conducted, I don't, you know, hold myself out as, as an expert on her 
opinions. And I, I think, you know, we'll be hearing in the coming weeks from those who have done a more comprehensive analysis of all the, all the judgments she's made. I haven't seen any um, that bear on these issues. Um, but the truth is that um, the judiciary has been remarkably deferential uh, especially since September 11, 2001, to the national security state. And I don't anticipate that she will stand up for any new level of constraint. It is probably not likely to happen in the case of foreign affairs, such as drone warfare or detention without trial either. I think that's right. Um, I think most of those issues have been settled um, in the sense that the challenges that were going to be made have been made. Uh, and, you know, sadly, the results are pretty permissive. Um, the, the, the president can, can, uh, is holding a, a kind of remnant of a much larger group at Guantanamo essentially indefinitely because President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama both for different reasons reached the conclusion that, um, that, that there was nothing to be done about at least the hardcore of, of some of those detainees. And as for drone warfare, actually the Supreme Court um, made a kind of unexpected contribution to the legitimation of drone warfare uh, in, uh, in, in, in some of its cases that were intended to rein in detention. Um, most famously uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Justice John Paul Stevens's opinion uh, in uh, uh, in I believe it was Hamdi versus the United States, um, there 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 is a a a decision that um, that the war on terror probably fits most comfortably in a certain box in international humanitarian law called non-international armed conflict, and as a result of that, the Obama administration concluded that. Um, the constraints on drone warfare were going to be very minimal. Um, and that hasn't really been challenged in, in the court since. And it's in, unthinkable that the Supreme Court would, would move in, in, in a kind of new direction, especially with Barrett on the court. Is it fair to say that people who join the federal bench or are nominated and join the Supreme Court are more likely to be differential to authority, otherwise they wouldn't have uh, been uh, nominated in the first place? You know, I think we have to kind of get, get a bit more of a kind of differentiated view. Um, it's certainly true that there's no way to achieve that outcome without having friends in one of the political parties. Um, and that usually means um, government service uh, on one of the two teams in American politics before further appointment uh, to the bench. A great example of that would be Justice Elena Kagan, who served in the executive branch and then as Solicitor General uh, before she was appointed to the Supreme Court. And you might suppose that that means that those who are eligible for nomination are already conformist to an important extent. Um, you know, some of us long for a day in which um, there were other criteria for Supreme Court appointment than the ones that prevail now, but, you know, never were radicals appointed 
to the Supreme Court. There was always a certain amount of, um, you know, uh, success within the mainstream of politics, um, uh, or at least within the legal profession, um, and usually within a party structure. Now that said, um, you know, you can't deny that there are some justices who after appointment when they have no real check on them other than their consciences um, move in quite interesting and unexpected directions um, and throw off the expectations that are placed upon them by those who appoint them. A, a good example, maybe the best would be Justice David Souter who retired a few years ago um, who was appointed by George Bush the first and was expected to help overrule Roe v. Wade, but um, really became one of the most principled liberals in, in, in the midst of a reactionary Supreme Court. So um, I would say we have to grant to those who are on the court a certain amount of credit when they, um, when they are led by the, their freedom to, to hew to their conscience rather than the expectations that have been placed upon them by the powerful who have put them there. And are there regulations? For example, when the son of Justice Kennedy is a bank executive who as dealings with President Trump. Is that not problematic? Um, is there a certain conduct that uh, leads to a corruption investigation or is there really just the conscience? Well, you, you know, you, the essential answer is no, or there are self, self-enforced regulations. Um, in general, the justices sometimes recuse themselves from cases in which their interests are, are personally implicated or in which they're seen to have a conflict of interest. Um, one cause group called Fix the Court, which your viewers can find online, um, it has a website, um, among other things, wants to make sure that the Supreme Court justices are subject to the same ethics rules as other judges in the federal system. Um, I doubt that would have affected the case you have in mind, um, just because um, the 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 it, it, they would they would uh, they would have affected Justice Kennedy in so far as anything re maybe related to Donald Trump or related to the you know the business dealings of Donald Trump, um, you know came up but as for you know the larger relationship between the two i think there's there's no no rules that make that improper of course there are ethical views that according to which it might stink to high heaven but you know no formal or rules or or even weaker norms to the best of my knowledge <laughs> 